I also do not want to be remiss in this one opportunity, but at, at special feasts such as this, I want to express my gratitude to all of you who support our parish, this beautiful building that we have, that we have recently celebrated the centennial of. May God reward you, and, and, uh, and, and of course, I want to encourage you with your support for the years to come. Reverend Father, venerable religious, dear parishioners and guests, I think it's important that on this greatest of church feasts, that of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we always remember that connection between Easter Sunday and Good Friday. Is it not most true to say that Easter Sunday would never have happened if there hadn't been a Good Friday. The glory of the resurrection, so beautifully expressed in the midnight mass of Easter with the unveiling of the statues and the lights and, and the beautiful music and all of that, that is a reminder of that stark contrast, but that connection with the death of the Lord on Calvary. And to this day, that most impressive church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, has under the very same roof, and it's a very vast church, but it has under its very same roof, just a couple of hundred feet apart. And I was privileged, myself and Mr. Steve Waco, this past November, to see it. Calvary is there, and there's the tomb of the resurrection. A connection that can never and should never be broken. And as we can see, what is it that is above the tabernacle? Even on the ma- at the Mass of the Resurrection, the priest does not offer the Mass except in front of the crucifix. There's that most intimate, strong, and powerful bond. And hence we have the saying, without the cross, there is no crown. And Therefore, as we celebrate Easter, we should be encouraged by the glory of this feast to keep persevering in bearing our crosses in life, to face whatever God allows to happen to us, to bear our sorrows and and sufferings, and to live that difficult Christian life, which it is obviously at times, to live it so that we can remember that there will be a most glorious reward for us. It's in human nature, though, to want to have the, the crown, but not the cross. And yet, it can't happen. I came across a beautiful quote here from one of the fathers of the church who writes... God is a lamb that avails you not, my Christian, if you become not also a lamb of God. The cross on Golgotha redeems not from evil, if it is not also erected in thee. The dear Christ's death aids you not, my Christian, until in him and for him you also have died. So you see, that is the Christian life, not just to seek the glory of the resurrection, but to know what merits it. It was so interesting to me to see in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher a contrast between the tomb, which has its own little church built on top of it, and Calvary. And I couldn't help but notice that many more people wanted to visit the tomb of our Lord where the resurrection happened, but it seemed like significantly fewer wanted to go up the steps. And yes, inside this church, since it's so big, you have to go up the steps to Calvary. And I didn't 
Well, it just crossed my mind as we spent some hours there. And then, then Mr. Waco remarked to me, why are there so many more people at the tomb of our Lord than on Calvary? So he was echoing what I was thinking or my, what my own thoughts had been. And I don't know, perhaps, you know, perhaps it wasn't as clearly marked, but hopefully that wasn't true in reality, that people came to see the tomb but did not come to see the cross. Again, they are inseparable. And I think this church was probably the place that impressed me the most, that touched my heart the deepest. Because it was there on Calvary that the redemption happened. I think it's safe and correct to say this. The redemption didn't happen at the tomb. It happened where he gave his all and he gave his life. And that's where you and I were spiritually redeemed and spiritually born born because that's where Jesus said to the beloved disciple, and we see, of course, Our Lady and St. John there, he said, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. And so that's the connection we should not fail to remember Jesus was in beginning to enjoy his reward at the tomb, but it was there at Calvary where the full price of redemption was paid. My dear brethren, we are not resurrected yet. That's most obvious. But the Feast of the Resurrection when we need it to encourage us, when the cross gets heavy, that resurrection tells us, keep persevering. It's coming. The reward is coming. Look at the cross, but also look at the resurrection. It will come to you. Just persevere. And also, Our ladies. It happened also with our Blessed Mother as well. She went through all that agony on Calvary, but then who rejoiced more than her on Easter Sunday? No doubt our Lord appeared to his mother first and said, Mother, we have done it. I as Almighty God, you as the co-redemptrix. It was the will of the Father. It was my will too that you be part of it that you, together with my infinite work, redeem fallen mankind to help make him good again. So you see, Easter Sunday is the feast of faith. It's there to encourage our faith, to make us persevere in what we have to go through in this life. Remember what St. Augustine said, and I mentioned this in recent weeks, he calls faith the eye of the soul. And the stronger the faith, our faith is, the better that spiritual eye sees and the more the Catholic faith makes sense. It, and it matters not. And if the sufferings and difficulties and contradictions should be there, so what? All the more glory, all the more reward. So may this feast of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ fill you with the deepest and greatest joy May it increase your faith, your hope, and your love for him who has resurrected never to die again and who awaits us in paradise with his holy mother. Let us keep persevering, keep our eyes on the crown, on the reward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.